Good evening, friends and subscribers of the BDRP. This is your host, DDoS. Joining me is the Fathoms of Fortiana host and creator, Mr. Timothy Beloved. What's up, Tim? How do, how do, hey, everybody? Doing great. Um, jumping right into it, we uh, I, I watched the Hunt for the Skinwalker documentary. I didn't see any of the terrible reviews. But uh, after watching it, I, I suggested to you, as it was suggested to me, and I think it was very, very revealing. More so than the books or, or any of the other radio shows were. So today we're going to do a quick review or uh, overview of that documentary, as well as jump into some of the stuff that it touched on that we really didn't hear anywhere before. So first off, I, I like the way it was directed. I, I think that was one of the main complaints that it was trendy and it went for like a, uh, a, a pulp type lettering and stuff like that. I, I I dug it. I liked it a lot. It's right up my alley. Yeah, I thought it was good. I actually just lost you there, man. I just got dropped. Um, uh, I'm assuming you just went through, you know, how you felt about it and what was going on. But um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine, bro. Okay. Yeah, uh, it was a lot more um, more concise than I thought it was going to be. Um, all the reviews I heard about it um, from, no, you know, pretty notable podcast um, host and uh, numerous different podcasts, they, you know, kind of poo-pooed it. Well, I can't say numerous, but um, more, more than a couple of hosts. Um, kind of poo-poo did they they kind of whined about the production values or the way that um it was like edited together like it was supposed to be like you know big gap and there was nothing new there was nothing they just kept making it sound like it was um just the book like reenacted and uh i found it to be a lot more insightful than than just about any interview i'd, I'd heard over the past decade with george knapp um or any of the people involved in that. Right. And George Knapp did a fantastic job. He was very forthcoming on the stuff that he could be forthcoming on. Uh, the, he, he revealed a lot of details that you won't find in that book. Uh, how this phenomenon, the poltergeist activity, would actually follow people outside of the realms of that ranch. And, and you've heard me talk about before how the Brown Springs going in there You'll find this heavy, weird activity in one place, or it could be a mile down the river. He actually noted that about Skinwalker Ranch as well, how the activity would seem to fluctuate not only to the ranch, but the surrounding areas. I found that very, very interesting. Uh, we, we've heard stuff like that in different active areas and where you find Dogman and Bigfoot. Nine chances out of ten, you always see this weird are you at least read about these eyewitness accounts of orbs, UFOs, lights in the sky, um, lights through the trees. The main difference between uh, an active area like Brown Springs or LBL or something like that is just the, he the heaviness of the activity at Skinwalker Ranch. It seemed like it was nonstop for the Gorman family, the quote unquote Gorman family or the Sherman family. That and the strange creatures that seem to be natural creatures, but none that were that you would find indexed anywhere in, in America or anywhere else in the world. So uh, the, I, the, I think that it has to do with. Um, well, I won't get into any of those ideas yet. We'll, we'll jump into that later on in the show. What was what was your favorite part of the documentary, Tim? Um, man, I would say just finally being allowed to be taken inside of uh, the Skinwalker Ranch, you know, um, to be able to see, you know, footage that you you didn't get to see uh, any other time other than like, you know, some way off <laughs> photographs of, of, of like a Utah desert landscape. And, uh, and the occasional, I think there was like one or two pictures that um, Shadowlands had way back in the day when they were doing their UFO ranch series which i believe is the same story they just had a different name for it um because i think nids had produced some like a small website or or something with a little bit of 
uh, evidence, although I, you know, it's been so long and I, I couldn't find it anywhere. But uh, yeah, man, just being able to see it and kind of get a feel for the place, you know, the, you know, the pen and the and the trailer where the alleged bulls were were all, you know, stuck inside, and and then the middle, like sort of the middle homestead that that you heard reference all the time, right. and I realized it was kind of like a just a, I mean, I'm sure 20 years ago there may have been a little bit more to it, but it was it was pretty much like something straight out of a ghost town, all just torn up old old farm homestead right that uh, we were talking last night about how some of this strangeness may have affected the mind of the shermans you yeah. know uh, just for instance the big wolf yeah. now the, the way it described this wolf and what they when they saw a picture of it the, the closest thing they could describe to what they had on that property was a dire wolf a wolf that's almost as big as a horse but yeah. Sherman, Sherman talks about how he reached his hand out and petted that thing. There'd be no way in hell that I would, I wouldn't care if I thought it was a, first of all, I wouldn't think it was a neighbor's dog if it was as big as a dire wolf, nor would I stick my hand out to pet it on the head if it approached me. I don't, I don't stick my hand out to little Scottish terriers if I don't know it. <laughs> exactly. Let, let alone a, yeah, let alone a, a wolf. I mean, from, from, because I'm, I'm thinking, okay, this thing's, you know, a, an overly large wolf, but the way they, they talk, you know, so cavalier about, yeah, they even let it come up and touch him and whatever. And then when George Knapp puts his hand out and says, yeah, it was, it was, or I can't remember if it was George Knapp or the physicist, but he said, yeah, it was, it was about this tall, um, according to the Shermans. And I'm just like, what? Who in their right mind? And that's exactly, that's, that's sort of the point, would, would let this thing approach them, let alone touch it. And so, see that that's abnormal in my by my estimation that that seems like something else is going on with the people themselves. Maybe they're put in a type of uh, lowered state of resistance to that kind of weirdness. Yeah, it 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 seems to be. I mean, I I I could not picture myself doing that in a million years. Like like I said, I mean, I've been bitten by enough ankle biters to know. You know, <laughs> not to go near it, let alone a giant wild wolf. You know, yeah, no doubt. No matter how tame it's acting, you know, I mean, some uh, 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 a mountain lion can act incredibly tame the moment before it takes you. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, and um, especially again, its shoulders. In the book, it also uh, mentions how it came up to the car to the wife. And its shoulders, Mike, Mike just put it in there, Michael Gordon. Its shoulders was to the roof of that car. So I don't I don't see myself being comfortable, whether I thought it was some sort of a domesticated animal or not, reaching my hand out to pet an animal that's that big, especially I'm, I'm new to this property in this area. Yeah. I would have started shooting. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Yeah, especially if you just dumped all your money into, into getting this property and, and having livestock. I mean, you're that that's a predator. My, my first instinct, you know, it, my first instinct is and was, especially when I had the farm was coyotes um, don't belong. Raccoons don't belong. Um, any, you know, anything that size or anything I know to be a, a predator around my livestock. This is my livelihood. Um, it's not going to make it out of there alive or I'm going to or, or else it's going to get chased off with, with some injury. And yeah, there, you know, you hear. You do, you hear about how with infrasound, certain animals, um, especially per, per, predaceous ones, seem to have, there seems to be some sort of a culling effect or some sort of, um, yeah, some sort of dampening of, of their uh, flight mechanism, you know, of the, the animals they're hunting. Right. So, so maybe this, you know, thing actually had some sort of infrasound or exhibited that in it, and it was affecting uh, the humans. Uh, the way, same way it would affect, because it even seems to have affected the animals. I mean, uh, animals an, animals are skittish around uh, predators, you know, uh, coyotes or, or wolves. Uh, but the, you know, the baby, uh, or the calf went right up to it. And so, you know, to the point where it could just grab it by the snout and try to well, it. Yeah, it, it felt comfortable enough to stick its snout, you know, past that uh, barn gate. Yeah, that's not normal behavior. 
I mean, the, nor the normal behavior of a calf is if, if they didn't have it penned off from the rest of the, from the, from the rest of the herd, which, which they could have, but likely didn't, at least from the mother, um, is to, is to get as close to that mother as possible. And the exactly. Between the, and the calf. So, so none of the, none of the animal behavior, or human behavior, um, really was, uh, it didn't make sense. It didn't, it didn't fit the scenario. And that could be attributed to what they said was the Underground Railroad. I think that comes into play. The strange noises, the, uh, the metallic noises that they heard underground. Uh, right. When you, when metal you, on top when of you, metal. When, he, when he's speaking about the Underground Railroad, he actually means some sort of, of metro under the earth. Um, it sounded like they were building some sort of rail or some mechanized tunneling uh, was taking place, not not like some ghost story about the underground railroad from the civil war. <laughs> yeah. For, for those of the, that don't know the book, yeah. they described it as sounding like a literal underground railroad, um, metal scraping against metal. And I found that strange because they would say that parts of the pasture would light up. There'd be lights shooting from the pasture itself. Uh, pieces of the pasture, I, I believe it was 400 and some odd acres. Parts of the pasture would just be gone overnight, sometimes within moments. So I, I believe that factors in. I, I'll put it this way. I don't think anyone's really looked at the human element right. of Skinwalker Ranch and just how, and I'm not going to say, oh, it's all the government. It could be some government, but I believe that there's a human hand behind a lot of the activities taking place there. And I, I believe that's insinuated very heavily in the documentary itself. I Yeah, I think they... Um... They do insinuate, they insinuate a few things. I mean, if, if, if you watch it and kind of listen between the lines, if you will, there seems to be an awareness, at least with NAP, that there, there's more taking place than just uh, these entities or encounters with, with high strangeness. There seems to be a human element um, and whether it's behind it or coinciding with it. And we're not just talking about the Shermans. Um, we're talking about s something else, something potentially clandestine, um, that that there's some human element that's totally aware of what's what's taking place there, or at least um, confirms it. Yeah, it's hard to say. You know. Right. Well, moving forward into it, for those who have read the book, the animal mutilations, there was a calf that was oh, yeah. uh, mutilated to the point where it, it th there was no way it wasn't done with a <laughs> extremely sharp um, surgical instrument and with a hand that's precise and steady. And they found this. Uh, they say it happened within moments, which that very well could be. But I don't see how this cow could have been vivisected like it was within just a handful of moments. Uh, yeah, it, it was uh, cut up and it seemed to be placed there in a ritualistic type way. Yeah, they said it was what 40, 45 minutes from when they had first um, addressed that calf for tagging because they tagged its ear and they were going on to other other animals in the field um, to either check on them or, or tag them or whatever. Yeah, but but the, the caveat to that is this thing's like 50 yards away from them. It's not. It's 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 not like it's in another field. It's not like it's you know a mile away or whatever. It's it's within eyesight and earshot. And the bleeding of a calf. I mean, a calf calf will bleed for anything if it's grabbed, if it, if it's if it's whatever. Right. Even, even a cougar taking it by the neck, it's going to make some kind of a noise. Um, whether it, it's just you know the movement alone. So. Yeah, that was really perplexing, and and uh, um, I think the general consensus of the, the physicists involved in that, and the um, the veterinarians that came to to look afterwards was that this had to have happened off site. It had to have been done someplace else because there was no blood, you know, your classic cattle mutilation, uh, and there was evidence of sharp instrumentation utilized. You know, not a laser, but actual some sort of some form of knife or blade, and um, and then it was it was dumped back there, but it's like, okay, well, so what, which I guess kind of leads to the question because, but they don't mention it. They don't say they had missing time. They don't say that like, 
all of a sudden they went home and they realized it was 4 p.m. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, so there's no missing time involved in that incident. It, that we it, know of. That we know of. It appears to have happened in real time. Which, doesn't... which that's just complete. That's that that's the mind boggling thing. If they would have went home and said, oh, well, we realized it was two and a half to four hours later, then I, I'd say for sure that that calf would stake. There was no blood whatsoever. They brought out a professional tracker. The, the, the professional tracker couldn't find any tracks, but it was carefully placed in that pasture uh, right where it was tagged. They said. Yeah. yeah. And the tag was missing, too. I mean, that's even more insult to injury. It right. Was was cut off right at the base of the air, you know, or the that air was cut in such a way. I mean, they showed pictures of the, of, of the calf. That was something that they showed pictures and video from 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 Nap's video archives or NIDS archives, um, which I thought was super significant. And and it was weird too because again, there's that trickster, you know, they call it the trickster element, where it was like the one day in however many months that the NIDS guys had off. Right. And they had to fly him back from Nevada um, back to the ranch. <laughs> and see, this stuff would take place with heaviness whenever they'd be gone. Yeah. And, and, and the same way before they showed up, it, it always would take place when it was at its most unexpected, when you wouldn't expect things like that to happen. Uh, whenever they'd go out and look for it, they'd find nothing. You know, they put up these uh, corrals. And within the first night, the locks were completely gone and missing. Yeah. Uh, they, they made special corrals where they could put dogs in there to be, you know, a natural type of alarm for, for these strange creatures and stuff that would uh, come onto the property. Yeah, like a biological alert system, which was a great idea, honestly. A fantastic idea. And, you know, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, researchers in the chat that probably take a dog out and I've been thinking about that a lot lately, too, because they pick up on subtle things that we wouldn't from a whole lot further away than we could. Mm -hmm. Hey, I uh, just want to shout out to everyone in chat. How you guys doing? Got a, got a healthy group that keeps growing tonight, so it's cool. Yeah, thank you guys very much for uh, showing up. I know it's one of those last minute shows, so it means a lot to me. Uh, another thing, and, and here in a moment, we're going to get into a little bit of the stuff that we started putting together based on a few more gentlemen's uh, works relating to the same thing and directly relating to Skinwalker Ranch. So I don't think it's as anomalous and as strange and as unknown as, you know, some of the people involved would have you believe it is. Mm -hmm. that, that was another thing that we noticed when watching it. Um, there seemed to be, some sort of concisive view that wasn't stated but was insinuated that they have they they know about an origin or at least uh what's causing this stuff and what possibly could link it all together yeah yeah there was there was definitely the um the underlying sense that they there was pertinent information that at this time could not be released regarding this. And, um, Nap, Nap was pretty, pretty kept certain things pretty close to the chest. And I've heard subsequent interviews with them since watching this, um, uh, regarding the, the events there. And, um, he's pretty open about a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, like surprisingly open, even, even like, um, uh, kind of opinionated on on uh, Bigelow and he, he was one of the only guys that I know that did a full length interview with Bigelow and so for him to like be closed mouth about certain things because he, he is a reporter first as far as we know um, yeah as far as we know <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, I mean I have to say that but it was an interesting um, just interesting watching his body language during the dialogue um and, and the presentation of, of, of the whole thing and from event to event. And for those of you who have not seen the, uh, the, the documentary yet, he kind of, they kind of waffle back and forth before, like um, from original footage, like these sort of uh, catalog of, of original footage from the nineties to um, current day um, footage as they were live at the ranch or not live, but as they were filming um, at the ranch, uh, uh, 
this year or last year. And um, one, one other thing that uh, I noticed about NAS behavior, and this one thing we talked about, I believe he knows more than what he, he lets on, and he is forthcoming about what he can and can't say. Yeah. But he seems to be very well informed and very I mean, I don't want to insinuate the man some sort of spook or part of any kind of black ops or anything, but he is just a journalist. If if, if you look him up, like that's his background. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem like it takes any less. Yeah. 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 And and it, it sounds too like um again in other interviews I've heard of him, the people that he's interviewing are are aware of that and, and they they do say some things off record or they'll say things um, off the cuff to him. That's not part of the interview. And he, and he doesn't talk about it, but they do voice. They have, it seems like they have voiced um, concern to him with what he'll share and what he won't, because they look at him as just a journalist. So, right. So that is. And dipping pretty- my toes in a journalism, man, like that's something, you know, uh, journalistic integrity is dead basically. Yeah. But to not put forth pertinent information, especially when you spend your time and effort to get that information, to dig it up and to go knock on doors to find out things. Um, I don't know. It, 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 it makes me kind of scratch my head a little bit in a few places during this uh, documentary. Yeah. Crypto PTSD asked where the ranch is at. It's, it's actually in the um, it's in Utah and it's I think it's called the, the Ute. The, it's the U Uinta Basin. Yeah, the Uinta Basin. Thank you. So it's a, it's in Ute territory. Ute is a First Nation tribe out there. Yes, sir. And they have, I think, a million square acres in the Uinta Basin. Yeah. And I, I do think part of it, I think we were talking about this too, it, it does connect with Four Corners, which is J.C. Johnson's old stomping grounds. And um, just that whole area up there in, in, I don't know if it's northwest or northeastern Utah, I think it's Northwestern. Um, it's very weird. Um, and, and again, you're, you're talking about miles and miles and miles of area where this phenomena appears to happen all over, not just this ranch. This ranch was an epicenter of study, but it it's not necessarily limited to this ranch. Right. It happens in all the surrounding areas. Yeah, it appears to. So, uh, and Timothy's a little bit more well-versed than I am in this, uh, what we're going to jump into next. I've been studying it the past two days, but there are a couple of gentlemen who wrote a book based on these phenomenon. Um, one was named Nick Redfern and the other one was uh, Mr. Ray Boucher. Yeah. Yeah. Nick, I mean, for anyone who's been involved in, you know, podcast of uh you know the paranormal for any any really any significant amount of time at all like you've heard the name nick redfern um he's a very prolific writer i mean the guy writes there's jokes there's actually memes that you know in in the time that it took for us to talk about nick redfern he'd written eight books (laughs) (laughs) because that's just how the dude is but um yeah he wrote a book in 2010 where he published a book called um final events and what is the sub final events um and the secret government group on demonic ufos and the afterlife (laughs) that's the full title of it and i think what he was doing initially was um uh he was going he was researching the men on men in black or the raf uh, ufo the rendlesham forest thing um with with the raf and um ray boucher um was brought in at some time, I think, as a consultant uh, for the military, like like a sort of a religious consultant, maybe in the seventies or I don't exactly know. Ray Boucher is a um, he's a pastor, a theologian, uh, but he was also a MUFON director. Um, I think in the early nineties. Uh, don't quote me on that. Which is but, fascinating. Yeah, but he like in ninety ninety four, uh, they were at the Gulf Breeze UFO conference, and he, he produced a few papers, and one of them was on Men in Black. And long story short, um, Nick Redfern was kind of, I think, doing some research on the Men, Men in Black, and he has put books out on that, so it makes sense. And 
he got in contact with Ray Boucher, I think based on some of the, the um, presentations he'd done for MUFON uh, to ask him. And Ray kind of went into this whole aside about the government, you know, knowing and clandestine operations, you know, think kind of conspiratorial things. But, but the spin was a group of individuals who had come to him outside of the government um, and they were brought in for whatever reason, physicists, uh, some of them were spiritists, whatever, and they had been brought in to, to I don't know if it was to deal with or to measure or to work on some of this UFO stuff. And they told Ray Boucher, um, uh, they called themselves the Collins Elite, and um, they told him that look, there's there's more to this. The more you know, the more we study this this extra dimensional thing, there's really no evidence that it's extra dimensional or alien even. Um, it seems to be some sort of high satanic agenda involving the government and um, and what they call NEDs, which are, or NH, no, N, NHEs, I believe, non-human entities. And but what they are were demonic beings masquerading as aliens and performing all kinds of weird